eternal spirit of God, mighty Jehovah, the one who sits in the heavens and does as he pleases. We bless your name this morning. We thank you. Our hearts are filled with gratitude, O oh God. Words are inadequate to express just how we feel about you. But Lord, you who know the thoughts and the intents of every heart, I ask that you would look into our hearts this morning and receive the praise, the adoration, the thanksgiving that is in there. Blessed be your holy name. As we go into your word, teach us. Establish us in the present truth. Continue to will and to do of your good pleasure in our lives. Let men see us and give glory to our Father who's in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. God bless you all. You're welcome to Bible study. This is I Believe Bible Fellowship. We're in Houston, Texas. We studied the Bible verse by verse because the Bible says line upon line, precept upon precept. And we believe it's the only way you can truly understand scriptures. A book that's written over uh, centuries by different authors, different backgrounds, different experiences in God. Yet there's one common thread running through it all. The only way to truly understand it is to read it the way we read it and study the way we study it. But thank God for the insight that he gave us to do this. We, we, we weren't thinking, it wasn't deliberate, but it's turned out to be his will. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Okay, Lord, we receive a proper studio where we can do stuff without all these interruptions. In Jesus' name. We're in the book of Proverbs, chapter 14, is where we'll start from this morning. Still contrasting evil, wickedness, and good, righteousness. Uh, we started that with um, chapter 10, and it's still ongoing even at this time. Proverbs 14, 1. Every wise woman builds her house, but the foolish plucketh down with her hands. He that walketh in his uprightness feareth the Lord, but he that is perverse in his ways despiseth him. And the mouth of the foolish is a rod of pride, but the lips of the wise shall preserve them. Where no oxen are, the crib is clean, but much increase is by the strength of the ox. A faithful witness will not lie, but a false witness will utter lies. A scorner seeketh wisdom and findeth it not, but knowledge is easy unto him that understandeth. Go from the presence of a foolish man, when thou perceivest not in him the lips of knowledge. The wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way, but the folly of fools is deceit. Fools make a mark at sin, but among the righteous there is favor. The heart knoweth his own bitterness, and a stranger doth not intermeddle with, joy, with his joy. The house of the wicked shall be overthrown, but the tabernacle of the upright shall flourish. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are ways of death. Even in laughter the heart is sorrowful, and at the end of that mirth is heaviness. The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways, and a good man shall be satisfied from himself. The simple believeth every word, but the prudent man looketh well to his going. A wise man feareth and departeth from evil, but the fool rageth and is confident. He that is soon angry dealeth foolishly, and a man of wicked devices is hated. The simple inherit folly, but the prudent are crowned with knowledge. The evil bow before the good, and the wicked at the gates of the righteous. The poor is hated even of his own neighbor, but the rich hath many friends. He that despiseth his neighbor sinneth, 
but he that hath mercy on the poor, happy is he. Do not err that devise, do they not err that devise evil? But mercy and truth shall be to them that devise good. In all labor there is profit, but the talk of the lips tendeth only to penury. The crown of the wise is their riches, but the foolishness of fools is folly. A true witness delivereth souls, but a deceitful witness speaketh lies. In the fear of the Lord is strong confidence, and his children shall have a place of refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. In the multitude of people is the king's honor, but in the want of people is the destruction of the prince. He that is slow to wrath is of great understanding, but he that is hasty of spirit exalteth folly. A sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy the rottenness of the bones. He that oppresseth the poor reproacheth his makeup, but he that honoreth him hath mercy on the poor. The wicked is driven away in his wickedness, but the righteous hath hope in his death. Wisdom resteth in the heart of him that hath understanding. But that which is in the midst of fools is made known. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Praise God. Again, like we said, it's comparing evil and good, the wicked and the righteous. Scripture says every wise woman builds her house. Every wise woman builds her house. And I'm sure you all know when you want to build, the first thing you want to do is count the cost. And then you begin to gather all the resources that you need. And you carefully and skillfully put all those resources together. Marriage is not easy. And no one said it is. That's why when we conduct marriages, we say to the couple, it's not a state that you enter into unadvisedly. The mistake a lot of people make is they're guided by their loins when they want to settle down. That's not the only reason why you get married. Yes, the Bible says rather than burn, get married, but there has to be wisdom and there has to be much thought. But if you're already in it, it's not too late because there's nothing God cannot fix. He is the resurrection and the life. I don't care the state of your marriage, God can fix it. It just requires that both of you be willing to let him fix it. The Bible says if any two don't agree, they cannot walk together. And I do appreciate that. But if you're in a marriage, Woman, it takes work, it takes diligence, it takes patience. You don't build a house in a day. And it's something that you do daily. The beauty of it is that God has given us the grace and has given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. And if we would depend on him and do it his way, then we will get his results. The trouble with marriage today is that we have walked away from the way God set it up. And we have all kinds of experts out there telling you what you ought to do and what you ought not to do, what you ought to tolerate and what you ought not to tolerate. I asked the Lord many years ago, as you all know, I'm divorced, not by choice. He walked away. But I asked him many years ago, I said, what's the big deal with marriage? He said, there will be no marriage in heaven. And he gave me several answers, but two have stayed with me. He said, first of all, when you have a huge project in front of you, the best way to tackle it is to take it in portions. And so in order for God to govern the world, he needed to break it up into smaller units, families. 
And if families are careful to remain families, godly fam families, then in structuring or governing the world, it becomes easy. That's the first thing. We must strive to build godly homes based on godly principles, regardless of what your spouse is doing. As long as there's no abuse. All right? And I don't want to go into that. We're not doing a marriage seminar right now. But you have a responsibility and your responsibility is not predicated on what he does or what she does. It's predicated on what the word of God has commanded that you do. All right? That was the first answer God gave me. The second answer, he said, it is the only place that I know that you can build genuine character. It's the only relationship that you cannot just walk out of willy-nilly. Every other relationship, I can tell you, hey, take a running hike. I don't have to be your friend. I don't have to be your sister. I don't have to be your brother. I don't have to be anything to you. But when you are in a marriage, the Bible says God joins. I know we have laws and whatnot, and we can divorce, and we can separate, and we can do all of that. But ultimately, that's not the mind of God. And so there are, there are, there are words of wisdom. There's guidance in the scriptures as to how to conduct ourselves in our homes. So without beating that and, and going any further than, our, than I've already gone, the Bible says if you're wise, you build. You build your husband. You build your children. You build the atmosphere in the home. You preserve the atmosphere in the home. You're a praying woman, a praying mother, a praying wife. And I know some people will say, yeah, you don't know who I'm married to. Yes, I don't know who you're married to. But at the end of the day, you are answerable to God and what he's called you to do. All right? So it's every woman who builds. The foolish one tears it down with her hands. And there are many ways that we do that, especially us women. We're very emotional. Sometimes we're irrational. Um, and we don't depend on God. We need to learn how to depend on God because it's not the easiest of things uh, dealing with someone who is completely different from you. That was something else I asked the Lord. I said, Lord, why don't you just spare people that I like so that we don't fight? If we have the same interests and we do like the same things and we go to the same place, then we'll be friends. And I could hear the Lord laughing, quotes. And he said to me, he said, it's the difference that cements you. You should celebrate the difference. It's arrogance on the part of any husband or wife to want, to want their spouse to be like them. Why can't you just be like this? No, I can't. I wasn't made like that. And it's the difference between the both of you. That's the rebar in the concrete. That's what holds you guys together. If I want to stick a tile on this wall and I put the mortar at the back of the tile and I put it on it, it's going to slide down. I would have to scarify the face of the surface, the surface of, of the wall or whatever, before I can stick the tile on it. So it's the differences that hold you guys together. God said, your strength complements his weakness. His weakness complements your strength. The two of you working together have no weaknesses. That's the wisdom of God. May God help all you that are married and are, and are striving to, to, you know, Stay in the marriage and preserve your home and preserve the integrity of a Christian family. I release grace tonight, this morning, in the name of Jesus on you, wisdom on you, patience, and everything that you need to succeed. Your homes will not fail in Jesus' name. The Bible says, he who walks in his uprightness fears the Lord. All right. Both are mutually exclusive. If you fear the Lord, you will walk uprightly. And if you walk uprightly, it's because you fear the Lord. But the person who is perverse in his ways despises God. That's why he doesn't care. And he does whatever he likes, whenever he likes, however he likes. It's my life. People are fortunate I'm not God. I'll show you the breath that you breathe is mine. And then where will you be? In the mouth of the foolish is a rod of pride. 
because the foolish speak anyhow. They don't guard their lips. But the lips of the wise preserve them because they know when to talk, they know when to be quiet. Verse 4 is a business scripture. And all it says is zero times zero equals zero. Where no oxen are, the crib is clean. If you don't have oxen to plow the field and, and so that you can farm and do what you need to do. I'm not a farmer. I don't know how it works. But these guys were an agrarian society. And so they measured wealth and work and all of that by the animals that they had. If your crib is clean, you don't have any animals plowing your fields, then of course, uh, you don't have anything. Zero times zero is zero. But with much increase comes the strength of the ox. If you have the ox that's plowing the fields and you're able to, to sow and you're able to reap and all of that, of course, there will be increase. So have something in hand that God can multiply. Zero times zero is zero. I don't care how silly or stupid people think the idea is. The only idea that's stupid is the one that's in the cemetery. That was never given the time of day. And the person died with it. Everything around us started with an idea. The chair you're sitting on started with an idea. The table you're writing on started with an idea. This phone started with an idea. And when the idea was pursued to its logical conclusion, we have everything that we see around us. As a matter of fact, my book is complete, praise God. It should be out in a couple of months maximum. One of the things that's greater than money, there are four things that the Lord taught me that's greater than money. And I know I'm not talking about money, but I'll throw it in for what it's worth. If you don't have any money, if you have any four or all four of these, money will look for you. The first one is an idea. An idea whose time has come. Money will follow it. Venture capitalists will fall over themselves to fund it. So don't despise ideas that come to you, no matter how foolish they are. There's one that I know God is going to spank me for because he gave this to me in 1996. And I haven't done anything with it. And I know if I step out with it, it's something that will fly. I know it. I talk about it all the time, but I haven't done anything with it. Lord, I repent. Help me. But an idea whose time has come, money will follow it. All right? Favor. If you have favor, money won't be a problem. Favor is somebody helping you for no just reason. Helping you with their money, helping you with their resources, helping you with their time. They just, they just like you and they just want to help you. If you have favor in the right quarters, your proposal will get money. Access is greater than money. As a matter of fact, there are people who make a living just on access alone. If you could jump on the phone and say, hey, Joe, how you doing? I'm in Washington, D.C. next week. Can I stop by? You call the president. What can you possibly need? if you have access to the president of the United States. And access is not favor. You may have access and not have favor. Your uncle is filthy rich. You have access, you can go to his house, you can eat at his table, you can sleep over, but he's not interested in your proposal. You have access, you don't have favor. Two separate things. There are people who broker access. They put A in front of B, they get a broker's fee for it. All right, and the last one is influence. Influence, and there are four kinds of influence that I've identified. To make it easy for you to remember, PPBB, providential influence, which is what God gives some people. They tell you, let's go jump in the lake. You follow them. You don't even question them. They just have a way with people. People do what they say. It's provident providential influence. Then positional influence, influence that you have because of a position you occupy. Then there is birth influence. Influence that you have because you are the king's son or the king's daughter. You're a prince or princess. You're the president's son or the president's daughter. Doors will open for you simply because of that. It's closely tied to access. All right. And then the last one, which is really, really tied to access, is borrowed influence. Borrowed influence is by far the most powerful of all influences. 
because you borrow the influence of a powerful person and it opens doors for you. People pose for photo shoots so that they can have a picture up on the wall, them standing beside the president. And they don't really know the president. President doesn't even know who's standing next to him, but they'll do anything to get beside him and just get that one picture. And when you see that picture, you think they know the president, it's a lie. But they will lean on that and they will borrow that influence to do whatever they, that they wanna do. So money is not everything, all right? There are other ways that God can creatively provide for you financially. A faithful witness will not lie. Yes, because he's faithful, but the false witness is full of lies. Don't say what you didn't see and don't say what you're not sure of. Don't pass on news that you're not 100% sure about. A scorner seeks wisdom and he will not find it because he's gone for. He doesn't think there's anything in it. So he won't even recognize it if it jumped up and slapped him in the face. But knowledge is easy to the person that understands and knows what they're looking for and is diligent in their search. The Bible says, go from the presence of a foolish man. Don't even, don't even try to convince them. Don't try to, to say nothing because they won't listen. They're foolish. Jesus said, don't cast your pearls before swines. Would you put a ring in the snout of a hog when you know it's going to dig the mud and the earth with it's not. No, you wouldn't. Don't bother with a foolish person when you perceive that there's no knowledge in his lips. That's why you should be quiet. The Bible says even a fool, when he's quiet, people think he's wise. Listen to people. James chapter one says, be slow to speak. Be quick to listen. And I believe that's why God gave us two ears and one mouth. Listen twice as much as you speak. And then the instrument responsible for speech, your tongue, he talks it away and sets two fat gods, your lips, and a fence, a white picket fence around it. Your tongue is behind your teeth, behind your lips, because God doesn't want you to talk anyhow. Praise God. Go from the presence of a fool if you perceive that there's no knowledge in him. The wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way. So a man that's prudent is guided. He seeks to understand before he takes one step. He weighs stuff before he takes a decision. He doesn't just run ahead. But the folly of fools is deceit because the fool is deceived and he continues in his foolishness because he's deceived. Fools make a mock at sin, but among the righteous there is favor. Of course, fools will make a mock at sin when they don't think sin is sin. And that's one of the, one, one of the tactics of the enemy, even today. He renames sin so that it can be acceptable. He calls homosexuality alternate lifestyle. And they, there is tremendous funding out there for all kinds of study to prove. I read on the internet that there are 41 genders. That is madness. You're either XS, XX female or XY. Even if you do a sex change, you're still either female or male. The Bible says male and female made he them. And he called their name Adam, Genesis chapter 5, Eve was inside Adam before he pulled her out. If you read Genesis chapter 5 verse 1, you will see it. The Bible says male and female created he them, and he called their name, created he, he him, and he called their name Adam. That's why when women say, I want a man who's, who's in touch with his feminine side, there's no feminine side in a man. God took it out and fashioned Eve with it. Praise God. The Bible says the heart knows his own bitterness and a stranger doth not intermeddle, intermeddle with his joy. Of course, you know when your heart is heavy and you understand you know, what you're going through, passing through. 
Even so, when joy comes, a stranger can't mess it up. Because you are the one who knows exactly how it is that you're feeling. The house of the wicked shall be overthrown and the tabernacle of the upright shall flourish. Pretty straightforward. Makes sense that you should walk uprightly so that you can flourish. There is a way that seems right. It looks right. It feels right. The Bible says the end thereof are the ways of death. Don't be quick. Don't be hasty. The Bible says he that believeth shall not make haste. I miss some more. She would have been putting all those scriptures up for me. But if I tell you the Bible says, just make a note. Go and Google it. You'll find it. All right. He that believeth shall not make haste. Coronavirus taught us that. The whole world came to a standstill. And the world did not come to an end. Be careful, be diligent, waste stuff, seek counsel, study, read up on it, do your research, do your due diligence. Don't be hasty with decisions. Even in laughter, the heart is sorrowful, sorrowful, and at the end of that mirth is heaviness. Talking about the cyclical nature of our emotions. Because it's cyclical, it's unreliable. One minute you're happy because there's money in your account. The next minute you're sad because you don't have any money. Your emotions cannot be dependent upon. It's fickle. That's why your will must rule over your emotions. Praise God. The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways because to backslide is a choice. If you're a child of God and you truly have the spirit of God, the minute you begin to step away from uh, being upright, the Holy Spirit will minister to you. He'll let you know you're going down a slippery slope. If you persist, then you're violating the greatest gift that God has given us, which is self-will. Sin doesn't just happen. It starts with a thought. That's why the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, to take captive every thought and bring it to the obedience of Christ. It starts with a thought. And when you caress it and you entertain it and you think about it and you ponder over it, you begin to plan. You plan, you execute. That's how it works. But the minute it comes, the Bible says there's no temptation that's going to seize you that's not common to man. But alongside that temptation, there is a way of escape. So when I see temptation, I look beside it. There's a way of escape. God will make provision for you. The Bible says he will keep you so that you will not slip or fall. If you do, it's because you willfully do so. All right? The good man will be satisfied from himself because he's careful. The simple believes every word, and the simple is the fool. And the fool is simply someone devoid of wisdom. A fool is not an abusive word in the scriptures. It's a descriptive word. It describes somebody who lacks wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And the Bible says the simple believes every word. So people come and tell you stuff, and you swallow it hook, line, and sinker. You should sift stuff. I don't know who's ringing my doorbell. But I'm not expecting anyone. They're going to have to wait or come back. Praise God. Don't believe everything you see. Don't believe everything you read. Social media is full of lies. Even news now lies to us. There's no one single media house that tells the truth anymore. Not one. Praise God forevermore. The symbol believes every word, but the prudent man looks well to his going. The prudent man, the careful man, the thoughtful man, the man who doesn't leap before he looks. A wise man fears and departs from evil, but the fool just carries on. But the man that's wise is careful 
is watchful. He that is soon angry dealeth foolishly. Anger is a legitimate emotion. But God gave it to you to act or to function like a fuse. If there's a spike or a surge, there's a fuse in my TV that ensures that the entire device is not blown. The fuse blows. And all I have to do is re re replace the fuse and my device is still intact. That's what anger is. That's why in Ephesians 4.26, the Bible can tell you be angry, but don't sin. It's possible. If it wasn't possible, God wouldn't tell you to do it. I've trained myself to the point where anger is a decision. I decide when I get angry. You cannot make me angry. It's taken years, but I've trained myself to be that way. So it's possible. Be angry, but sin not. Don't sin in your thoughts. Don't sin with your mouth. Don't sin in your actions. It, it's okay to be angry. God gets angry, but he doesn't sin. The Bible says it's foolish when you act angrily, when you speak angrily. A man of wicked devices is hated. Who's going to like him if he's full of wicked devices? The simple inherit folly. The simple is the foolish. Someone who does not have wisdom. He will continue in foolishness because he doesn't have wisdom. But the prudent are crowned with knowledge because the prudent is diligent. The prudent is careful to search out a matter. The prudent is careful to study, weigh his options. The evil bow before the good and the wicked at the gates of the righteous. The poor is hated even of his own neighbor, but the rich hath many friends. That's sad, but that's human nature. He that despises his neighbor sinneth, but he that hath mercy on the poor, happy is he, because the person who has mercy on the poor is in essence lending to the Lord and he will recompense. Psalm 41 talks about a sevenfold list of blessings that's waiting for the person who will consider the poor. You have to give to the poor, all right? There are many avenues through which you can give to the poor. Look for not-for-profit organizations that are doing what they say they will do. I Believe Bible Fellowship has a parent organization called I Believe Foundation. We don't have overheads because we're all comfortable. The money goes where we say it's going. Unlike many of these not-for-profit organizations out there, they have so much overhead. They have staff. They have, they have buildings. They have vehicles. They, I mean, Google the salary of, of Red Cross, the salary of the CEO of Red Cross. And tell me what, what, what does he do that justifies that? And I don't care where this thing goes. Praise God. Give to the poor. Adopt a, a family, you know, research a, a not-for-profit organization. Research them. And then make up your mind that I will, I will give to, you know, the organization or the family or whatever. I think it's, uh, I want to say Exodus. Is it Exodus or Deuteronomy? The Bible says the poor will always be amongst us. And therefore God commands, commands that we open our hands to the poor. All right. Verse 22, do not, do they not err that devise evil? Of course they do. But mercy and truth shall be to them that devise good. So if your thoughts are filled with good things, if you are constantly looking for how you can, you can be a blessing and how you can make life easy for somebody else and how you can assist someone and how you can, uh, you know, practice righteousness, the Bible says mercy and truth will find you. Verse 23 is a business scripture. In all labor there is profit. But the talk of the lips tend only to penury. Keep talking and not doing. It's 
not going to lead anywhere. A true witness delivers souls, but the deceitful witness speaketh lies. All right. Some of these things are pretty straightforward. In the fear of the Lord is strong confidence. When you walk with the Lord, there is confidence. Sometimes the confidence almost borders on arrogance, but it's not. Paul says, I know him whom I have believed. If you know the God that you serve, then like the psalmist says in Psalm 34, my soul shall make a boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Boast in the Lord. Let your confidence be in the Lord. And the children of such a person will always have a place of refuge because God is a very present help in time of trouble. He is our refuge. He's a strong tower. We run into him and we're safe. In the multitude of people is the king's honor. Yes. How are you a king if you don't have subjects? But in the want of people is the destruction of the prince. He that is slow to wrath is of great understanding. He that is slow to anger. Don't make excuses for that spirit. That's my personality, lie. That's just the way I am. I tell it like I see it, lie. Be slow to anger. Extend grace. Be merciful. He that is slow to wrath is of great understanding, but he that is hasty of spirit exalts folly. Because when you act hastily, when you have not uh, taken the time to count the cost, you make costly mistakes. All right? A sound heart is the life of the flesh. A sound heart. And I'm not talking about the organ that pumps blood. It's talking about your spirit and your soul, your heart, your spirit and your soul. When your spirit and your soul is all right, then your body is all right. That's what the Bible is saying. The cells of your body react to your words. It's a scientific fact. Be careful what you say over your body. Praise God. He who oppresses the poor is reproaching his maker. But he who honors the poor, he who honors God has mercy on the poor. So to give to the poor is to honor God. Because God said, I am their defense. The poor, the widow, the fatherless, and the stranger. God said, don't mess with those four categories of people. I am their defense. So when you give to the poor, you are in essence honoring the Lord and you're lending to the Lord. The wicked is driven away in his wickedness, but the righteous hath hope in his death. Yes, because we know there's no finality in death. We may think there is, but there is not. Death is just a doorway. It's a portal to step from mortality into immortality. Life continues after physical expiration. All right? Because we're first of all spirit. We're just in this body to be able to cope and operate in this realm, this physical realm. When we transition into the spirit realm, we no longer leave the body, need the body. That's why we leave it behind and we go. Praise God. Wisdom rests in the heart of him that has understanding. But that which is in the midst of fools is made known by the opening of their lips. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It's not what goes into you that defiles you. It's what comes out of you. That's how we size you up. That's how we know whether you, you're worth hanging out with, you're worth doing business with. All right? And then 34 says, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Only righteousness can exalt the United States of America or any other nation for that matter. That's why Christians have to get their act together. We're divided. We are divided. How can we then minister to the country? 
It's only righteousness that will exalt America. America didn't become great by the things we now see. God was in the center of this country. And that's why it is unique. And what was built in the almost 300 years of its existence is still lasting till today, in spite of all the nonsense we've done to destroy a lot of it. We've got to go back to God. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Psalms 24, 1. The world and everybody that's in it. That's why the Bible says the kingdoms of this world, they will become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. It belongs to him. But we've driven him out of government. We've driven him out of the schools. We've driven him out of public places. And they're even choking Christians now. I will die before anyone silences me. Praise God. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Any questions, any thoughts? Is there a 35th verse? There's a verse 35. I oh, all right. Even when I read that out, I didn't see it. Thank you. The king's favor is toward a wise servant, but his wrath is against him that causes shame. Pretty straightforward. A wise servant will serve wisely. He will serve in a way that's pleasing to the king. And so he will always have favor before the king. I'm reminded of Nehemiah. He must have been very faithful for the king to notice that there was something wrong. Because it was the king that asked him, what's wrong with you, Nehemiah? And he said, well, the walls of Jerusalem are broken down. How can I be happy? And the king said, what do you want? He told the king what he wanted. The king provided everything for him, including military escort. Wherever you're working, <clears throat> let's draw a parallel so that you understand. Work diligently. Let that business, that company, that organization know that they are being blessed simply because you are there. Be conscientious. Get there on time. Leave when you're supposed to leave. Don't take stuff from the office. It's stealing. It's the little foxes that spoil the grapevine. Don't read your Bible in the office. That's not what you're paid to do. Serve diligently. And God will exalt you. Any questions? Any thoughts? Comments? Let's see if we can knock out chapter 15. A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. The tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. A fool despiseth his father's instruction, but he that regard, regardeth reproof is prudent. In the house of the righteous is much treasure, but in the revenues of the wicked is trouble. The lips of the wise disperse knowledge, but the heart of the fool, foolish doeth not so. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. The way of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord, but he loveth him that followeth after righteousness. Correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way, and he that hateth reproof shall die. Hell and destruction are before the Lord. How much more than the hearts of the children of men? A scorner loveth not one that reproveth him, neither will he go unto the wise. A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart the spirit is broken. The heart of him that hath understanding seeketh knowledge, but the mouth of fools feedeth on foolishness. All the days of the afflicted are evil, but he that is of a merry heart hath a continual feast. Better is little with the fear of the Lord than with great treasure and trouble therewith. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is 
than his stalled ox and hatred therewith. A wrathful man stirreth up strife, but he that is slow to anger appeaseth strife. The way of the slothful man is as an hedge of thorns, but the way of the righteous is made plain. A wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish man despiseth his mother. By folly, sorry, folly is joy to him that is destitute of wisdom, but a man of understanding walketh uprightly. Without counsel, purposes are disappointed, but in the multitude of counselors they are established. A man hath joy by the answer of his mouth, and a word spoken in due season, how good is it? The way of life is above to the wise, that he may depart from hell beneath. The Lord will destroy the house of the proud, but he will establish the border of the widow. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, but the words of the pure are pleasant words. He that is greedy of gain troubleth his own house, but he that hateth gifts shall live. The heart of the righteous studieth to answer, but the mouth of the wicked poureth out evil things. The Lord is far from the wicked, but he heareth the prayer of the righteous. The light of the eyes rejoiceth the, the, the heart, and a good report maketh the bones fat. The ear that heareth the reproof of life abideth among the wise. He that refuseth instruction despiseth his own soul, but he that heareth reproof getteth understanding. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, before honor is humility. All right. A soft answer turns away wrath. That's pretty straightforward. It takes two people to get into it. If you answer with a gentle answer, you disarm the person. Even if they still keep on yelling, they will be quiet when they see that your response is, is gentle and understanding. And one thing we need to understand when we respond, the way the Bible says we should res respond, it doesn't mean we're fools. And it doesn't mean we don't have a million and, words, a million and one words to speak. It's just wisdom. Better to diffuse a matter than to escalate it. All right? Previous words will aggravate the situation. There's a way to apologize even when you are not wrong. And it will disarm the person. The tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright. But the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. So there's a way to use knowledge. There's a way, there's a right way to use knowledge. There's a wrong way to use knowledge. That's what the scripture is telling us. For one, there's a right time to say what you have to say. And there's a wrong time to say what you have to say, even if it's the right thing you want to say. There's a timing to effective communication. There are times when the person you're talking to doesn't want to hear what you have to say. And if you want reception for what you want to say, then you look for the perfect timing to say it. All right? The eyes of the Lord are in every place. That should put holy fear in you. That God sees everything that you do and say. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life. Cultivate the habit of speaking good and blessing people. They'll notice you. I bless people all the time. It's something I taught myself to do. Workmen come to my house when they're leaving. I bless them. I make sure they hear me. Thank you very much. The Lord bless you. Some stop. Some say, oh yeah, God bless you too. And they go. But speak wholesome words. The Bible says it's a tree of life. And a tree of life bears fruit. All right. A fool despises his father's instruction. But he who regards reproof is prudent. If you listen to counsel, you're wise. If you think you know it all, I'm sorry for you. Because life will teach you. 
In the house of the righteous is much treasure, but in the revenues of the wicked is trouble. That's the business scripture. When you do things right, God will bless you. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Matthew 6, 33. And all these other things that we're chasing after, they will be added. And when God leaves adding, he multiplies. When he leaves multiplication, he exponentially multiplies. That's when one plus one equals 10,000. Praise God. The lips of the wise despise knowledge. But the heart of the foolish doesn't do so, obviously, because the person is foolish. Sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. When you're still steeped in wickedness and you're coming to say, I'm sorry, God will not be mocked. He can see your heart. But the Bible says the prayer of the upright is God's delight. God delights in us coming to pray. That's why he tells us, Jesus says, men ought always to pray and not faint. And uh, we've talked about prayer. I'm not going to go into it. But prayer is what permits God to act. There is no spirit being that's authorized to operate on earth. It's illegal. That's why he had to become incarnate. He had to take on flesh to come to the earth. And so for God to be able to operate on earth for him to continue to operate on earth when he returned to heaven in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ he constituted a legal body through which the Holy Spirit can legitimately operate it's called the body of Christ that's what gives God legitimacy on earth otherwise no spirit being is allowed to operate here that's why we can cast out devils and they obey us they know they're illegal all right. Correction is grievous to him who forsakes the way. And who hates, and the one who hates reproof will die if they continue in their waywardness. Hell and destruction are before the Lord. How much more the hearts of the children of men? Again, that should make you fear the Lord. A scorner loves not the one who reproves him, neither will he go unto the wise, because he's not interested in wisdom. He's not interested in doing things right. A merry heart makes a cheerful countenance. Do everything within your power to be merry. Put on music. Speak wholesome words. Don't let the enemy drag you into depression. Reach out to someone that you know can pray with you, stand with you, talk to you. All right? Because it's, it's usually the first dart, the first arrow that he throws. If he can destabilize you in your heart, then he can destabilize you in every other area of your life. By sorrow, the heart of the spirit is broken. By sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. So don't allow sorrow. We can grieve, but we don't sorrow. They're two different things. Praise God. All the days of the afflicted are evil, but he that is of a merry heart will have a continual feast. So do all you can to protect, to protect your heart. Don't let the enemy steal your joy. Nehemiah 8.10 says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Protect your joy. Joy is a fruit of the spirit. It's different from happiness. Happiness is an emotional thing. That's why you can be happy and unhappy. Joy is constant. It's the fruit of the spirit. All right? If the enemy cannot steal your joy, then he cannot steal your strength. Better is little with the fear of the Lord and great treasure with trouble therewith. I'm sure you will agree with that. Better is a dinner of herbs where there is love than a stalled ox and hatred therewith. A wrathful man will stir up strife. An angry man, always angry, he will always cause anger wherever he goes. But he who is slow to anger will appease strife. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. They shall be called the sons of God. Don't add to that problem. If you see two people at variance, look for a way to settle it. All right? The way of the thoughtful man is, an, is as an hedge of thorns. But the way of the righteous is made plain. 
because in his thinking, he has built this hedge of thorns around him. He doesn't want to move. He says there's a lion outside, so he doesn't go out to work. A wise son makes, a glad, makes glad a father's heart. All right? But a foolish man despises his mother. Folly is joy to him that is destitute of wisdom. But a man of understanding will walk uprightly. 22 is a business scripture. It says, without counsel, purposes are disappointed. Do your due diligence. Do your research. Don't just say, oh, I hear this is working, so I'm going to try it. No. All right? In the multitude of counselors, the Bible says there is safety. And whatever you're deliberating upon, because you've done your research, you've asked questions, then you will be established. <clears throat> A man has joy by the answer of his mouth and a word spoken in due season, how good it is. That's the same thing with uh, verse two, that the tongue of the wise will use knowledge aright. The way of life is above to the wise that he may depart from the hell beneath. The Lord will destroy the house of the proud, but he will establish the border of the lowly or the widow. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, but the words of the pure are pleasant words. 27 is a business scripture. He that is greedy of gain will trouble his own house because he will be scheming and just looking for any which way to make money. All right? But he that hates gifts will live. The right word should have been bribes. At times they use bribe for gift and they use gift for bribe in the translation. In this instance, it's not talking about gifts. No one hates gifts. It's talking about bribes. And bribery is paying someone to do what they ought not to do. All right. The heart of the righteous studies an answer. He's careful, he's diligent, he listens. He thinks about it before he comes up with his opinion. The heart of the righteous studies an answer, but the mouth of the wicked just shoots whatever. You can see how much importance God places on how we speak, when we speak, what we speak. All right? The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. Pretty straightforward. The light of the eyes rejoices at the heart, and a good report maketh the bones fat. All right, the ear that hears reproof of life abides among the wise. So it's good to hear and to listen. Hear and listen. Pay attention. He who refuses instruction despises his own soul. Because if you're void of instruction, if you're void of knowledge, if you're void of wisdom, if you're void of understanding, you will just make mistakes throughout life. Someone is telling you do this, you're saying, ah, I really don't like it. I'm not cut out for that. I don't really think that's me. I'm sorry for you. Take, take, take stock. This time last year, where were you? What were you doing? What did you have? Where are you this year? What have you done? What have you achieved? And you are being counseled. Why don't you try this? Why don't you do this? Come, let's do this. And you're like, no, no, I'm not cut out for that. Before you know what's happening, you'll be 67. If Jesus tarries. Ask me about it. I remember 28 like it was yesterday. And I'm wondering where all the years have gone to. Sometimes I want to run up the stairs. I take the first two and my body tells me, be careful. It creeps up on you. Praise God. He who refuses instruction despises his own soul. But he who listens to correction will get understanding. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom. And before honor is humility. If you fear the Lord, you will receive instruction and wisdom. And if you humble yourself, God will lift you up. That's what the Bible says. 
Any questions, any thoughts, any comments? All right, let us pray. Father, thank you. The entrance of your word brings light. It brings understanding. It brings illumination. Thank you for the pithy saints that's in the book of Proverbs. They are deep, oh God. We ask that you will grant us insight, grant us deeper understanding. Open up scriptures to us, oh God. Give us clarity of mind. Help us to see the truth that's in your word. More importantly, help us to apply it in practical ways in our lives. Lord, we ask that you will use the word to change us, change our minds, change our thinking. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, let our lives reflect the effort that we're putting into studying your word. Let us not be hearers only deceiving ourselves, but doers of your word. Thank you, spirit of grace, that as we continue to press in and to seek you, we will find you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. God bless you. See you tomorrow. I want to encourage you to come. We're going to pray. Come prepared. All right.